Hi, uh, welcome to our first Australian 3P seminar. Um, so some of our audience members might be new to this session. So I'll just give you a brief uh, rundown of what 3P is. It's a platform that was created between the Van Andel Research Institute in Michigan, Grand Rapids, um, and the Cure Parkinson Trust and the World Parkinson Coalition. And this platform was created so that early career researchers and mid-career researchers can have the opportunity to present um, First of all, this happened twice a week during the beginning when labs were in lockdown, and now we've changed to quarterly as more people are back into their labs. Um, so I just wanted to know, uh, let you guys know, if you, anyone's interested in speaking at future 3P events, uh, email 3pseminars at gmail.com or contact us on our Twitter, uh, 3P Seminars. If you look at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A function. So if at any time you have a question for one of the speakers, please use that function to submit your question and we'll get to it at the end of their presentation. So our first presenter today is Carissa Barthelson, a PhD candidate at the University of Adelaide. And she'll be presenting on Alzheimer's disease using zebrafish knock-in genetic models. So over to you, Carissa. Thanks so much, Michaela. I'll just share my screen. Okay. All right. So yeah, I'm Carissa. I am a recently submitted PhD student at the University of Adelaide. And today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about my PhD project where I've been um, generating and analysing zebrafish uh, genetic models of familial Alzheimer's disease. All right. So Alzheimer's disease or AD is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder and the most common form of dementia. It was first described back in 1906, but we still don't have a cure or any effective uh, preventative treatments. And this is because we still don't have a firm consensus on the pathogenic mechanism. Without a significant breakthrough, the incidence of Alzheimer's is gonna to continue to increase due to the aging population. So we really need a better understanding of the disease so effective therapeutics can be developed. Now there are two broad subtypes of Alzheimer's which are classified based on whether it runs in families or arises sporadically. Then it can be further divided as to whether it shows early or late disease onset. So the majority of cases show late onset of after 65 years of age and arise sporadically with no distinct cause, but it likely involves a complex interaction of genetic and environmental factors. In some rarer cases, it can arise much earlier in life, so before 65 years of age, and arises due to dominant mutations in a small number of genes. This form of the disease is called early onset familial Alzheimer's disease or EOFAD. So what does the AD brain look like? Well, we know it takes about 20 to 30 years to develop and there are many pathological processes occurring in the late stage AD brain. We see neuronal loss and the shrinkage of the brain, the presence of intracellular tangles, which primarily consist of a hyperphosphorylated protein called tau, and the presence of extracellular plaques, which mostly consist of a short peptide called amyloid beta. We see impaired cerebral glucose metabolism and high amounts of neuroinflammation. There are many other pathogenic processes going wrong in the late stage AD brain, so it's really difficult to tell which one is, is the causative one. And also damage to the brain may be too considerable in the late disease stages and may even be irreversible. So we need to understand the early changes occurring about here, decades before symptom onset, um, to be able to prevent the damage from even occurring. However, we can't access a young pre-symptomatic AD brain for detailed molecular analyses. This is why we must use animals. Now, the most commonly used animal model of AD research is the mouse, and they're generally transgenic mice, which typically express multiple human EOFAD mutations in the same animal, and often under novel promoters. The idea is to force the brains of these mice to look like a late stage human AD brain, and as early in life as possible to allow research to happen quickly. However, this isn't really representative of the genetic state of the human disease, as EOFAD arise, arises due to single dominant heterozygous mutations. Now, Hargis and Blalock, they showed that um, brain, the brain transcriptomes of these transgenic mice do not show concordance with human AD. And they don't even show concordance with each other, which is concerning and raises the question of whether these models are an ideal model to understand the effects of the AD mutations. Now, there are mouse knock-in models of AD mutations, which have engineered mutations in the endogenous gene to replicate the human disease state. 
However, they're very rarely used in the field, as shown here by the number of papers in PubMed per year, which cite knock-in or transgenic mouse models of Alzheimer's. But we think that uh, these mice will probably more accurately uh, model the direct effects of the mutations. So our research group and my PhD thesis aims to address this gap in the research field by generating and analyzing knock-in zebrafish genetic models of EOFAD. The approach of our lab is to as closely as possible recreate the genetic state of human EOFAD in zebrafish by generating endogenous mutations similar to that of mutations which cause EOFAD in humans and then analyze them in heterozygous state as EOFAD is a dominant disease. Unlike the transgenic mice, this strategy does not make any prior assumptions about the pathogenic mechanisms. So the overall question we're trying to address using our zebrafish models is what are the common molecular changes occurring in young adult EOFAD mutation carrier brains? So to address this question, we've generated a collection of different EOFAD-like mutations in the zebrafish presenilin-1, presenilin-2, and SOR1 genes. Uh, the mutations are shown here in blue. And we've also generated non-EOFAD-like mutations in the same genes as negative controls to determine the effects specific to EOFAD. Uh, so we've been performing transcriptome analysis, specifically RNA-seq, which is currently the most detailed and high molecular resolution method of phenotypic characterization. And we analyze this RNA-seq data to ask in an unbiased manner, which cellular processes are altered by the different EOFAD-like mutations. And we're looking for the common pathways and processes affected by the different EOFAD-like mutations in different genes in young adult brains to define the early EOFAD transcriptomic signature. So I don't have time to tell you um, all the full details of the signature today, but I will first tell you a little bit about my work on presenilin 1. And this work was recently published. So if anyone is interested, you can find more information in this paper in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. So presenilin 1 is the gene most commonly mutated in EOFAD. Um, here's a schematic of the protein. So the orange residues are sites of pathogenic mutations and the blue, blue residues are mutations which have uncertain pathogenicity. Now, the role of presenilin 1 in the cell is a really complex story. It's most well known for its role in the gamma secretase complex, but it has a lot of other functions as well. And I really could talk all day about it, but unfortunately I don't have enough time. But there is uh, one very important, but very simple rule I'll tell you about, the reading frame preservation rule, which states that in-frame mutations in presenilin genes cause early onset Alzheimer's disease, and frame shift mutations do not cause early onset Alzheimer's disease. The molecular reason for this is unknown, and this leads to the question I wanted to address in this work. Uh, why do in-frame mutations in presenilins cause EOFAD while frame shift mutations do not? So to address this question, I've generated some mutant zebrafish which model these types of mutations and are actually found in human patients as well. So the first one uh, is I generated the first knock-in zebrafish model of an EOFAD mutation in presenilin 1 which is actually an exact equivalent of the human EOFAD mutation, t 440 del And the patient who carried this mutation actually showed a bit of a mixed dementia phenotype, including symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So we thought this would be a particularly interesting mutant to make and add to our collection. We also generated a frame shift mutation modeling the human mutation P242FS. This is the only frame shift mutation in a presenilin gene known to cause a skin condition, familial acne inversa. Importantly, humans with this mutation do not get EOFAD. Now these two mutations cause their respective diseases when heterozygous, so that's how I've analyzed them in the fish. And from here out, I'm gonna to refer to them as the EOFAD-like and the FAI-like mutations. So I've crossed fish heterozygous for either of these mutations together to create a very large family of sibling fish, which can be raised together in a single tank. This reduces genetic and environmental noise, which allows us to detect subtle differences due to the mutations. And actually, this is one of the huge benefits of using zebrafish as a model organism for these types of experiments. So we perform RNA-seq in the brains of our fish at six months of age, when zebrafish are recently sexually mature. And this age is roughly equivalent to early adulthood in humans, which would be modeling the very early presymptomatic disease stages. Our study design allows comparisons between the wild type fish and the heterozygous mutants. The trans heterozygous fish who have one um, acne inversa like and one EOFAD like allele, they're also generated, but these fish don't represent a human disease state and they aren't really informative to us to understand the effects of the mutations. So we don't analyze them. 
<laughs> okay, so now for some results. So I first wanna show you the results of a principal component analysis or PCA of the brain RNA-seq data. So for those who aren't familiar, uh, PCA can be used to explore the, over the overall similarity between samples and where the variation in, in the data set is coming from. So the idea is that samples which have similar brain transcriptomes will cluster together in these plots. And if, um, mutation, if the mutations resulted in widespread changes to the transcriptome, we should see three distinct clusters of samples by genotype. However, despite our careful study design to minimize all other sources of variation, the majority of the variation in the data set is not really coming from presenil and one genotype. There might be a little bit of separation from the, across um, the second principal component, um, but this principal component only explains about 10% of the total variation in the data set. So the takeaway message from this analysis is that these mutations only have really subtle effects on the brain transcriptome. But this is okay, since these fish are modeling the earliest changes which occurred decades later, uh, decades before symptom onset in humans. So next, I want to tell you about my gene set enrichment analysis. Um, so for this analysis, I use the KEG gene sets to identify which cellular processes might be altered by each of the mutations. So this heat map summarizes the p-values for the significant gene sets with the brighter and more yellow values being the most significant. So I found statistical evidence for changes to gene expression in both common and distinct KEG pathways. So, sorry, um, both mutations had significant effects on inflammation shown here by the uh, cytokine receptor and JAK-STAT signaling pathways coming up. And they both altered the expression of genes which encode the components of the ribosome. The EUFAD mutation had specific effects um, on genes involved in energy metabolism, such as the TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. And interestingly, the keg gene set for Parkinson's disease also showed up here. And the acne inverse of mutant appeared to affect the expression of genes implicating signal transduction. So for example, the notch, neutrophin, toll-like and wind signaling pathways. And this is, um, these pathways are known to be involved in the pathogenesis of acne inversa. Our group has generated another zebrafish EOFAD mutation in presidolin 1, a Q96K97 del. This is an in-frame two-codon deletion in the first luminal loop of the presidolin 1 protein. And when I compared the effects of Q96K97 del to the EOFAD, like with the T428 del mutation on the brain transcriptome, I see that only the energy-related effects uh, occur in both of the presenal and one EOFAD mutations. So the, uh, the TCA cycle and, oxf and oxidative phosphorylation. Another interesting observation is that the keg gene set for Parkinson's um, is not did not reach statistical significance in the Q96K97 mutants, which was nice to see since our zebrafish T428 uh, del mutation models a human patient who showed Parkinson's symptoms before their onset of dementia. So this supports the relevance of my zebrafish mutation model. Okay, so in summary, why do in-frame mutations in presenilins cause EOFAD while frame shift mutations do not? Well, my results suggest it's because of their differential effects on signal transduction and energy metabolism. So that was a snapshot of my work on presenilin 1. I've also performed similar analyses to characterize the changes to gene expression due to mutations in presenilin 2 and SOR1. And these analyses can be found in a series of published papers and most of them being my work. And the final manuscript of the series summarizes all these previous papers and can be found in bioarchive if anyone's interested, but I'm just gonna take you a few of the highlights. So this heat map summarizes the keg gene sets which were significantly altered in at least two of our 11 zebrafish mutants across six RNA-seq experiments. And the only gene set which appears to be altered by only Alzheimer's related mutations is oxidative phosphorylation, suggesting that changes to mitochondrial function is a signature of presymptomatic Alzheimer's disease. However, I don't see a consistent direction of change in the EOFAD mutants as shown here by this heat map, um, showing the log fold change of genes in the oxidative phosphorylation pathway in each of our zebrafish mutants. However, you can't really imply the reality of what's going on in mitochondria from gene expression values, as we can't be certain of the feedback mechanisms are happening in the brain. 
So for example, it's the pathway overall down regulated because in reality, there's too much energy or too much ATP being generated. So our next steps are going to investigate the nature behind what's going on in the oxidative phosphorylation pathway in our mutants. We wanna do single cell RNA-seq, which will tell us the exact cell types which are being affected by these mutations. And we also wanna use metabolomic approaches to see whereabouts in the oxidative phosphorylation pathway is particularly vulnerable. So now I've covered some of the EOFAD genes, but what about uh, the sporadic late onset form, which accounts for the majority of Alzheimer's cases? Well, the strongest genetic risk factor for the development of late onset AD is the inheritance of the epsilon 4 allele of the gene APOE. Now, APOE is most no well known for its role as a cholesterol transporter, and there are three main alleles present in the human population. There's the epsilon 4 allele, which increases your risk for Alzheimer's about 15 fold when you're homozygous. Then there's the epsilon 3 allele, which has no risk associated with it. And there's an epsilon 2 allele as well, which actually has a small protective effect. Unfortunately, APOE is duplicated in zebrafish. Um, so there's an APOE A and an APOE B gene. And this complicates the analysis of single heterozygous knock-in mutations. But uh, fortunately, a human APOE targeted replacement or APOE TR mouse model exists and brain transcriptome data is available in the literature. This APOE TR model has a partial replacement of the endogenous um, mouse APOE gene with the sequences from the human gene. And it has either the, e, uh, the epsilon two, three or four se allele sequences introduced as well. So this comprehensive study by a group in the US uh, looked at each of the three APOE alleles in the targeted replacement mice. So epsilon two, three or four in both males and females uh, across aging. However, in their paper, they didn't actually perform a, um, a pairwise comparison between the APOE4 and th uh, versus the APOE3 at each age. Rather, their statistical approach um, tested which genes were influenced overall by genotype, age, sex, and the interactions between these. So I took their data and reprocessed it to do this pairwise comparison. Now, this data set had problems, both technical and the way they designed their experiment, which I don't really have time to go into today. But nevertheless, like our zebrafish models, I found significant changes to gene expression in the oxidative phosphorylation pathway uh, in young APOE mice, which uh, suggests that these changes are actually also occurring in late onset AD as well as EOFAD. So in summary, I found that the effect in common of different EOFAD mutations in different genes is their effect on the oxidative phosphorylation pathway suggesting that mitochondrial stress is an early cellular stress in both EOFAD and late onset AD. And we have now uh, applied for funding to dissect the nature of these effects. And I think that the way forward to finding an effective therapeutic for Alzheimer's is to attempt to understand the disease in the context of simple knock-in models, which are probably gonna give us a more consistent insight to the early changes, which eventually lead to, Al to Alzheimer's decades later. Uh, so I just want to finish off by telling you all about a new project our group has started where we're going to use a similar approach to understand the genetics of Parkinson's disease using zebrafish. So I haven't really spoken about this today, but we are very interested in the role of iron homeostasis in neurodegenerative disease. And we recently developed a method for testing for evidence of, of for iron dyshomeostasis in RNA-seq data. And using our method, we found evidence for this in four month old, so pretty young, um, zebrafish brains in a zebrafish model of Parkinson's. Um, so this came from a publicly available RNA-seq data set of Park 7 knockout zebrafish. We want to explore this further. So we're currently generating our own um, zebrafish models. So we're generating a knock-in model of the human LARC2 G2019S, which is G2009S in zebrafish. And when we generate this mutation, we actually generate frame shift mutations at the same site. So like my pre one project, I will cross fish heterozygous for these mutations together to form the family containing heterozygous mutants and their non-mutant siblings. And we can compare the heterozygous brain transcriptomes. And because um, frame shift mutations in LARC2 do not cause Parkinson's, we'll be looking for the transcriptomic changes, which occur specifically due to the G2009S mutation. And we're also generating a loss of function mutation in the gene DNA JC6. And this, uh, mutations in this gene are associated with juvenile onset Parkinson's and not a lot is known about the function of this gene. So this project is very, it's in, in its very early stages and this, it will help us to understand the pre-symptomatic changes which occur in Parkinson's 
and we'll begin our journey to finding novel uh, preventative therapeutics. I thank you all so much for listening. I um, just want to thank my PhD supervisors, Michael Lardelli and Morgan Newman. Also a big thank you to Dr. Steve Peterson, who um, is my bioinformatics mentor and has taught me all I know. Um, and also a thank you to uh, Lindsay. She's uh, our collaborator for the Parkinson's project. And finally, the funding bodies who without um, this uh, project wouldn't have been possible. So the Carthy Family Trust, the NHMRC and Dementia Australia. So thank you very much. Thanks, Carissa, for the presentation. Um, Thank you. So I guess as a uh, Parkinson's researcher myself, my first mm -hmm. question would be about what you just described would be looking at iron dis, uh, homeostasis. How are you planning on detecting that in the um, Parkinson's study you described? Yeah, so we our method involves um, looking at what's called um, iron responsive elements, which are in transcripts of mRNAs that are regulated by iron. And it's all based on whether if there's iron within the cell, um, depending on whether the, um, the iron responsive element is in the five prime untranslated region or the three prime, it will tell you whether the gene, the transcript is stabilized or whether it blocks translation. And so we've used that as a way we can detect differential abundance of transcripts in RNA-seq data. Cool, interesting. Yeah. Um, I guess, uh... With the zebrafish, I myself have read about it. I've never had any experience with that type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. What's the day in the life of a zebrafish scientist like? How can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, no, they're quite easy to look after. So we've got two fish rooms with about ooh, probably 200 tank, individual tanks of fish. So have about 50 tanks in each. Um, so we only like they're pretty low maintenance. We just have to keep the tanks clean. We feed them twice a day. So first, the first feeding is just dry flake food, where you just have it in a little dispenser. Yeah, dispenser thing. And um, then we feed them some like sea monkeys, the so live food, which is a bit better for them. Um, yeah, so it's quite fun. It's quite fun taking brains out. I find it really satisfying. <laughs> and yeah, yeah that so, must be quite challenging as well. How tiny, it's to be taking those out. <laughs> it's brains are easier than injecting embryos because uh, the embryos are fertilize externally so you can actually get a micro inject them um, but that's that's the one that takes a steady hand the brain's a bit bigger I think the brain's about a mil a mil one millimeter squared cube sorry mm -hmm. yeah doing so it under be... dissection microscope's not too bad yeah so all of your yeah. analysis looking at the um RNA seq and that that's done the whole brain sample then I guess compared to doing yeah. a mouse where you can look at individual brain regions that's not something you yeah can do with it that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all of us is like global brain changes. Um, we're hoping part of our NH, our next ideas grant um, will be doing another um, Alzheimer's gene, the APP gene. Um, since APP is also duplicated in zebrafish, um, we need to do it in a mouse. And yeah, that way we can actually do um, look at different brain regions and we can single cell RNA seq would actually be easier in mice because you get so much more tissue to play with. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Ooh, um, you mentioned about bioinformatics. I feel like that's a very popular and hot topic and lots of early career <laughs> researchers are trying to develop skills in bioinformatics. Do you have any suggestions for someone who would be looking <laughs> into trying to get into the bioinformatics scene? Yeah, um, so I started, I had no computational skills whatsoever when I started my PhD. I was not interested in doing it until I started like actually hearing about bioinformatics a bit more and what can be done with it. And the students in my lab, like they kind of explained everything in like a really accessible way. So I kind of decided, okay, yeah, I want to do it. So my advice would be to do as many like workshops as you can, like the Bioinformatics Society of Australia, they have like a student run group that they run really good workshops and they take you through the basics really slowly. And yeah, also find like a mentor. Most unis have like, a bioinformatics support service that can help you when you get stuck and yeah just practice every day because it is like learning a language oh, thanks we have a question here from lindsay colin prano it said fantastic presentation can you bit about how you think that iron dyshomeostasis may be similar or different across different neurodegenerative conditions like alzheimer's versus parkinson's for example right thanks thanks so much lindsay um 
Yeah, that's a bit different. It's hard to say as I'm not the expert in Parkinson's yet. Um, imagine that it would be similar processes because both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's do have a somewhat similar end result, like the, neuro the dementia does set in, but whether it's the same mechanism, maybe it's different, different mechanisms, we're not sure yet. But our project will be looking into dissecting that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you again. Excellent presentation. We'll now move on to our second speaker of the session. Uh, this is Dr. Julia Yang, a postdoctoral research officer at the University of Queensland. And today she'll be presenting on changes in the cerebellar activity during task-based and resting state fMRI in Parkinson's disease patients with mild cognitive impairment. Okay, I'll now... Thanks, Michaela. I'll share my screen. So thank you. Um, my name is Julia Yang I'm from the University of Queensland Centre for Clinical Research in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank for this opportunity to share my work at the 3P seminars. Um, my main interest in the field is cognition and neuroimaging markers in Parkinson's. And today I'll be presenting some of my PhD work that I completed last year. So the Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurological condition here in Australia, but remains one of the least understood. Over 100,000 Australians have Parkinson's disease and including their families and caregivers, this disease impacts 700,000 Australians. 38 Australians are diagnosed with the disease every day and the number has increased by 17% in the last six years with costs to the community increasing by over 48%. The annual cost of Parkinson's is $9.8 billion in Australia. With increasing life expectancy leading to growing elderly population, it is important to understand the disease and broaden our knowledge. Hey, you Julia. Um, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, it's showing up in presenter mode. Would you like to oh. try um, just change that so it takes up the full screen for us? Is yeah, it the present? Yes, yeah, sweet. Yeah. Thank you. you <laughs> Thanks, Michaela. No yeah. So with a Parkinson's disease, you typically imagine Parkinson's patients with um, motor symptoms such as stiff posture, muscle rigidity, tremor, and shuffling gaits. They are often well recognized by clinicians, and symptoms um, are symptom management are well established with the medication. However, there are a wide range of no motor symptoms such as cognitive impairment, dementia, sleep disorder, depression, anxiety, and so on that are often difficult to identify, undertreated, um, complex. Therefore, the concept of Parkinson's disease has progressively changed over time from motor disease to complex brain disease. So focusing on to the cognitive impairments in Parkinson's disease, approximately 30 to 40% of Parkinson's patients show cognitive impairments even at the time of their diagnosis. And with average 42.5% of Parkinson's patients experience mild cognitive impairments, so-called MCI. So the terminology first derived from MCI in Alzheimer's disease. So the concept of MCI is to identify patients who are at risk of developing dementia. So many studies have reported that PD with MCI has a higher risk of developing dementia. And study in Sydney has reported that 83% of Parkinson's patients will develop dementia in 20 years after their diagnosis. So in 2020, 12, the diagnostic criteria for PDMCI was published by MDS. The main basis for PDMCI diagnosis is first to have PD diagnosis, decline in cognitive ability, cognitive deficits on either scale of global cognitive abilities or formal neuropsychological testing, 
uh, with no interference in their functional activities. So the criteria has two levels, the abbreviated level one criteria with global cognitive assessments, which can be administered in a short period of time, and a comprehensive level two criteria with assessing at least two tests per cognitive domains, including memory, visual spatial, attention and working memory, language and executive function. So the MCI is diagnosed when patients score below their previous score, estimated premorbid levels or appropriate norms using one to two standard deviation cutoffs. So MCI diagnosis is met if patients fail two tests under each of the five cognitive domains, doesn't matter whether they fail two tests from one specific domain or two tests across any other domains. So in our sample of 79 PD patients, the frequency of MCI was 34%. Um, despite previously reported risk factors, our sample did not show any significant differences in the demographics, including age, education, except for gender, where PD MCI had more male patients. PD-related measures such as disease duration, medication level, and disease severity also did not differ, as well as the neuropsychological measures, including anxiety, depression, and apathy, were, that showed no differences between the two groups. Using global cognitive scales, including MMSC, MOCA, and PDCRS, the group with MCI demonstrated significantly worse than PD without MCI. So this highlighted that our sample was well characterized and cognitive impairment can be seen as a sole symptom, not in relation to any other factors. So heterogeneous cognitive characteristics of PDMCI was observed in our data set. So deficits in memory, executive function and attention and working memory were common. And as you can see in the bar graph, the PDMCI patients who had impairments in three or more cognitive domains all had impairments in executive attention and working memory and memory impairments. Um, patients with impairments in two cognitive domains were, were commonly observed, but again, with a mixed combination of those commonly observed cognitive deficits. So by just observing these graphs, um, you can see that understanding PDMCI is very challenging because of its heterogeneity. So taking further, um, we performed fMRI to the subset of our um, big data sample. There is a growing interest with the neuroimaging such as um, structural function MRI and PET scan to identify brain abnormalities in diseases. The fMRI is known to be the least invasive method which measures the bold signal whilst participants perform specific tasks or when they are at rest. So the BOLD stands for blood oxygen level dependent signal in the brain. So this is basically neural activity dependent changes in the relation to oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So when you imagine, um, for example, if you're looking at an image, the brain activity will increase by increasing the blood flow in the brain. So that will cause a widening of the blood vessels and the level of oxyhemoglobin will increase. As a result, the T2 star relaxation signal will increase, leading to a high MR signal. So in fMRI, brain is considered as thousands of voxels, like you see in the first brain picture, that the bold signal oscillates within these voxels and depending on the activity, we'll be able to um, pinpoint the activation that are changes during the task. So um, in our project, we aim to use both task dependent and resting state fMRI to identify the neural basis for 
deficits in commonly impaired cognitive function in PDMCI. So in this case, we focused on to the attention network task. So this is a very simple um, flanker task. So you press the button depending on the direction of an arrow as a target condition. So it is expected that the reaction time for congruent condition will be faster than the incongruent condition. We also have three Q conditions. So with a no Q, center Q and a spatial Q before they see the target. So spatial Q will tell us where the errors will appear, top or the bottom. Uh, and with this, the task allow us to observe into three different attention networks, including alerting by calculating the reaction time between the no Q and the center Q, orienting with the center Q minus spatial Q, and the executive control with incongruent minus congruent. So with their behavioral results, um, the overall reaction time was significantly longer in PD with MCI compared to PD without MCI and healthy controls. The overall accuracy again demonstrated that PD with MCI and without MCI performed significantly worse than the healthy controls, but there was no difference between the PD subgroups. Looking into the three attentional networks, the alerting, orienting, and executive, um, there was no network differences observed in all three calculations between the PDMCI and PD without MCI. Despite no behavioral differences, when we took it further and examined the fMRI data set, we observed that difference in the brain activity during alerting, which is the difference between no Q and the center Q. Firstly, we observed down regulation of the left postcentral gyrus in PDMCI compared to PD without MCI and healthy controls. Um, this was quite interesting finding because the fast rate of cortical thinning of this particular region left per central gyrus was previously reported in PD with MCI. And we also observed overactivation of cerebellum cruise one in both PD with MCI and PD without MCI compared to healthy controls. And during the resting, so the resting state is when the participants line the scanner with their eyes closed and think of nothing for eight minutes. So we're trying to map the networks that activates while the brain is at resting. And we found that the activation between the medial prefrontal cortex of default mode network nodes to the cerebellar vermis six was significantly higher in PD with MCI compared to PD without MCI and the healthy controls. So the default mode network in particular is a main network that's known to be upregulated during the resting state. So you can see how the um, PD MCI group has a very strongly activated in the connection between the DM and MPFC to the um, cerebellum compared to the other two groups. So by both task-based attention task and the resting state fMRI studies, we have found that activation of posterior cerebellum was increased in PD with MCI compared to PD without MCI and as well as healthy controls. So it, this, is, this was a very interesting result to find the cerebellum activity because often with the Parkinson's patients, the cerebellum, ten, cerebellum area is tend to be not included in the studies as we more want to focus onto the motor cortex, which is at the top of the brain. So um, the cerebellum studies in Parkinson's are quite emerging recently. So the cerebellum is also known as a little brain that has 
69 billion neurons compared to 16 ne billion neurons in the cortex, which is the bigger brain. And cerebellum um, coordinates voluntary movement, they uh, modulate cognition and emotion. And this part of the brain is technically helping the bigger part of the brain to work as smooth as possible. So the medial and lateral region of the posterior cerebellum, which we found increased activation with the um, PDMCI group is involved with cognition and particularly cruise one um, involving with sustained attention. So this study highlighted that we had the matched demographics and clinical characteristics between the PD MCI and PD without MCI, including the healthies as well. The hypermetabolism in the cerebellum was suggested to be a compensatory mechanism in PD, MC, PD patients to maintain the cognitive functioning. And the spread of pathology, we have to remember that the spread of PD pathology may not be severe enough to cause network disintegration. And it's important to think also that PD with MCI patients have cognitive deficits, but are not severe enough to be diagnosed with dementia and have unimpaired functional activities. And um, the few other studies have reported that these compensatory mechanisms may disappear once patients develop dementia. There are a few limitations to consider, including small sample sizes, broad criteria of PD-MCI, and stability of MCI in PD. So uh, we, the heterogeneous characteristics of PDMCI is the biggest challenge at the moment that even looking into the five different cognitive domains, there's still a mixture of different deficits that's difficult to pinpoint and narrow down the deficits in PDMCI. And also with the stability of MCI in Parkinson's, there are populations of PDMCI that could revert back to PD with normal cognitions. So the, the reversion rate and the progression rate needs to be considered in the cohort. However, this um, study addresses a gap in underlying mechanisms in patients with PDMCI and may facilitate the development of treatments and guidelines for identifications of PDMCI and possible Parkinson's with dementia. And to further understand the fMRI markers for early dementia, it's important to understand the heterogeneous characteristics of PDMCI, investigate on other cognitive domains with a larger sample size and perform a longitudinal studies or any other brain imaging analysis, including structural and a DCM analysis. So at this stage, more studies are definitely needed to understand the brain regions that help the brain to compensate, to exhibit normal cognition and to identify its importance once patients develop dementia. So I'd like to thank my team members, uh, our supervisory team and neurologists at the Royal Brisbane Hospital and of course, all the participants who have participated in the research. And the bottom is our um, link for our website. So if you want any further information on the project, feel free to go on and check. Thank you so much for listening. Sorry, Michaela, I can't hear you. Oh, yes. Oh? Yes, I can. Hello? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Technical difficulties.
technical difficulties. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Fantastic presentation, Julia. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on how does the MCI in Parkinson's disease patients differ to the MCI that's seen in Alzheimer's patients? So often researchers try to differentiate AD uh, MCI from PD MCI mainly by its memory impairments. So they say PDMCI have more executive language visual spatial deficits, not necessarily the memory impairments, but ADMCI has more of the memory impairments. But even with our sample, we have seen a very high prevalence of memory impairments. So, and there are portions of PDMCI patients that could develop out Alzheimer's pathology that could present more of the AD-like symptoms. So it's pretty critical for us to understand the differences so that we can refine the definitions of PDMCI. I think there's a lot of work to be done on this field. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, we have a question here from one of the attendees. The post-central gyrus is an interesting area to see affected, given that it's related to somatosensory function. How do you account for this being the region implicated in PD-MCI? Yes, that's a good question. So the post-central um, post gyrus, has, even though it's a somatosensory related regions, it also involved with the alerting reactions in the brain. So I think the somatosensory with the, the button pressing with the, that they need to be pressed as fast as they, they can might be related to the alerting type of networks linked to their um, somatosensory as well as their, their attention. Thank you. Uh, another question here from uh, audience member, Benjamin, wonderful presentation. You mentioned that the maintenance of cognitive function may disappear once they develop dementia. Do the cognitive domains decline at the same rate or are certain domains more susceptible? So there, there's a mixed studies reporting on such as like semantic fluency and visual spatial deficits may predict dementia, but um, not necessarily those deficits will 100% lead into dementia. So it sort of goes back to the heterogeneity. So it's like putting PDMCI in a one big pool makes a bit different difficult for us to identify how that person progresses or worsens through the time if we don't know what they were like at the beginning. So I think there's a still a big gap at the moment to put them into a big um, one group and see how, how they progress. I think even, even with different cognitive types, the domains tend to overlap it with each other. So if the executive function can be linked to memory and attention can be linked to. So it's very difficult to pinpoint one specific cognitive domains. So it's also important for us to develop a um, functional MRI task that could really narrow it down and pinpoint to one specific cognitive domain and then test it to prove that. Challenging. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned in your cohort of PD, MCI, that you saw a higher proportion of males, is that correct? And if so, yes. could you comment on why you think that might be? So the male gender has been mentioned as a, one of the risk factors in the longitudinal studies leading into dementia. So I'm not too sure that there might be a genetic factor, but yeah. But it seems like there's a multiple studies sort of seeing, seeing that results in unison, yeah. Um, moving forward, what do you think the clinical implications of this kind of research are? Yes, thank you. So we are very excited for our new clinical drug trials. So we are starting a new trial focusing on to treating PD patients with memory impairments. Um, so we'll be implicating neuroimaging markers to observe how the treatments work. So I think, identifying the specific memory, specific cognitive deficits and linking into the drug treatments might be the way to go forward. 
And would that be looking at their cerebellar activity in those patients once they're on the treatments or is that a separate kind of study? This is a separate kind of study. So with, with the, this drug, we are particularly interested in the hippocampus because that's mainly linked with the memory impairment. So yeah, but cerebellum could, it would be the second region of interest for us to look into. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for our excellent mm -hmm. presentation. Um, just wanted to thank both of our speakers again. Uh, thanks, Julia and Carissa, for volunteering to be our first Australian presenters um, at the 3P seminar series. Um, if anybody is interested in presenting in Australia or anyone listening from the UK or Europe, we also have sessions normally that are more uh, friendly to those time zones. So if you're interested, please email the 3P Gmail account um, or contact us on the uh, with our Twitter handle, which is 3P Seminars. If um, you're looking for when future sessions are as well, that's where you'll be able to find that information on the 3P Twitter account and also on the Cure Parkinson's Trust website where you registered. That's also where new sessions will be um, shown. So keep an eye out on that and thanks everybody for attending. Thank you.